Hello, I'm the Bunny Man. And I'm Crazy Susie. And we are in the Eyes of Terror. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully uh, everything is going well in your end, dear listener. Yep, we've just been bored, but we're healthy and safe, so you know. Well, I actually went outside today. I didn't realize that we had a sun still. <laughs> <laughs> so hot <laughs> and uh it was nice I, I had to do some work so outside it was nice quite enjoyable i have to admit to be out of the house for a little bit get some fresh air you didn't hiss at the sun i didn't hiss at the sun uh i usually hiss at the sun when it comes through the windows and that's been like that for like six weeks now for me so yeah. and the blue glow of my computer but <laughs> uh now uh other than that i mean i i was just Getting out there, at least getting some air. Take a nice little brisk walk somewhere. It has done me some good. Um, other than that, I am starved. <laughs> funny, aren't you? Funny. So, what do we do? you want to get into this, or do you want to do what are you drinking? We typically try to do what are you drinking. Alright, so what are you drinking? I've been having tummy troubles today, so I have ginger ale. Ginger ale. I prefer the bold. The Canadian Drive Bold, but that's just me. Yeah. So I am drinking Naragutsit. Uh, presents Delhi's Shandy. It's a refreshing, different beer, and it's sold on merit. It's beer with natural lemon flavor. Be weird if it's lime. And it says, Hi, neighbor. Great grandfather Del Delucci made his first frozen lemonade back in Italy in 1840. During the winter, he carried snow into nearby caves and insulated it with snow. When summer arrived, he mixed the snow with fresh local lemon juice and sugar, making a refreshing drink. Mm. His grandson, Angelo, introduced this icy treat to Rhode Island in 1948, and today there are over 30 deli stands across America. Ginst is proud to present this delicious shandy with the perfect balance of Nargestis lager and lemon flavor is refreshingly different. It's brewed in Rochester, New York. I actually know some people in Rochester. It comes in a can. A striped can. Yeah, it's yellow and what, green? Green, yes. And then uh, made of honor. It is 4.7% uh, alcohol by volume, one pint or 16 fluid ounces. It's an interesting can. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of one of those barber poles, just different colors. The striping on it kind of does, though. It's actually quite enjoyable. It's a nice jandy. Luna's having coconut cookies. He's very happy. Yeah. I highly suggest that. That's a nice. It'd be nice on like one of those really hot summer days after our day of work. Yep. Yeah. There's very little like aftertaste. There's a slight beery aftertaste. And then you can taste some like the lemon, but it's not overpowering. It's more of a sweet lemon. Um, you want to give it a sniffer? Yeah, it's pretty mild. Uh, so if you like mild beers, and it's um, amberish in color, right? Yeah. It's not like Budweiser amber, but it's on the darker side. But yeah, it's not too bad. So the film we're doing today is Starve. I hunger. It's 2014. It's one hour and 38 minutes long. You can find this film on Prime or YouTube. It is a horror thriller. IMDb gave it a 4.6 out of 10, which is a pretty decent score. The director of it is Griff First. Did you give the app how long it was? Yeah. Okay. Because I have like one hour forty two. You got like one hour thirty eight. Where did you get your information from? Prime. I always get it off of IMDB. Probably because there's those ads at the beginning of Prime. Maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> and the writer is Xander Wolf. The cast are Bobby Cambo plays Beck. Mariah. Bonner plays Candace. Candace. Bobby C. King plays Runyon. 
Cooper Huckabee plays Ezrin. Dave Davis plays Jiminy. Jiminy Cricket. (laughs) Thomas Francis Murphy plays Michael. Casey Dillard plays Woman. Number one. Yeah. (laughs) Jessica Lemon Wilkinson plays the detective. Number one. (laughs) Catherine Capello plays Agnes. Johnny McPhail plays Stu. Leah Hennessy plays Virago. Virago, I think is how he said it. Um, Peter Lawson Jones plays Norman. Tony Safford plays Donner. And Alyssa Fike plays the female Runyon. The full list can be found on imdb.com if you would like to view that. It was filmed in Mississippi. Mississippi. The basic overview of the movie is while researching an urban legend on feral children. Three fin- f- fins. The th- three fins <laughs> are sharks. <laughs> Land sharks. Three friends <laughs> find themselves trapped in an abandoned high school where they are confronted with an evil more sinister than the legend itself. The principal. Oh, no. He's not a pal. Not a pal after all. You don't want to go to the principal's office. No. All right. You're going to get spanked with that nasty paddle because you're bad. Ooh, kinky. <laughs> <laughs> it's not kinky if you don't wear a mask. How can you breathe in those medical masks? No, I wasn't. You'd be hyperventilating if I was you were like one of those, spanked. like, geek masks, you know, the full. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> That makes more sense. All right, we can tell where our minds are different tonight. Those are pretty hard to breathe in, too, so. Yeah. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so we open on three land sharks. <laughs> uh, so the we, movie actually starts with a quote. Uh, I didn't write the quote. Oh, darn. I want, okay, it's a quote by Jared Kintz. I want to end global hunger by feeding half the world, half the world's starving people, to the other half. He's, He's so generous. Yes. So we open on some screaming and maniacal, and maniacal laughter, and then we get the quote. Maniacal? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Maniacal. Maniacal laughter. <laughs> maniacal. <laughs> Neither of us can speak today. Nope. Yeah, evidently, he hasn't drank enough, and I can't drink, so you know problems. Then we see a guy hitting a body with a baseball bat. A voice comes over the um, the PA to congratulate him for winning a battle. And as a man eats hungrily, he looks over and vomits up his food. The, uh, the voice tells him, what a shame you worked so hard for that meal. Then the voice directs the tall figure to bring the body to him. And he some, sprays some, like, foggy substance. It sort of reminded me of a uh, fire extinguisher. Mm-hmm. And at the man, and that, like, he backs off because of that substance. Then we see a car driving down the road as it swerves to Missy Rabbit. We see a woman driving while the passenger draws a zombie creature, and they discuss his uh, work, his superheroes, and such. We find out that they aren't alone. Another associate was in the back asleep, and he wakes up and joins in the conversation. We find out that they are going to a, an abandoned town well, uh, where supposed feral children live, and he's doing it for research purposes because he's a graphic. Uh, he's a he's a comic book writer or a graphic novel. A graphic novelist. Sorry. I sally the name of graphic novelists everywhere. Woe is me. We find out that the town was Freedom, Florida. It has to be in Florida of all places. Florida man lives there. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, we find out some backstory that uh, 30 years ago there were some methane deposits that, that came. So this sort of like threw me off completely. Like, they act like 
they act like the methane deposits were like people. So they're like, so they came to this town and created sinkholes. I was like, hi, we're uh, methane. Uh, we're going to settle here, and uh, we're just going to cause a lot of havoc for you. Enjoy. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, they created giant sinkholes all over the place. Then the uh, the government came, forcefully shut down the entire town, and then there's rumors that started of feral children. Well, you know, if you're ever going to have feral children, I think Florida is the prime place for it. Uh... Where they uh, get out of the sinkholes and attack people. So they live in the sinkholes. They crawl out of the sinkholes for the unsuspecting victim that happens to wander in to this town on the off chance that they come into this town. So they're feral children and not gators. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and as they continue talking, a rock comes slamming through the windshield. As they pass under a bridge. Yeah, or an overpass. Uh, because I guess as their entire talking that it's this whole area is completely deserted. But the road looks really nice for a deserted road. So I guess that public works team was working. They didn't get the memo. Maybe they're the Feral Children Public Works team. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gotta keep the road clean we gotta eat um, yeah. make sure it's presentable yeah so the the boyfriend the guy whatever gives out the the, the, comic, the artist gets out starts to Beck. Beck yeah I always think of the beer or you know Ted Danson's TV show Beck uh, yeah yeah, so um, Beck gets out. I guess it's Becker, but whatever. Yeah. So um, Beck gets out of the car, tries to chase after his fiance. Of course, just like don't go chasing after waterfalls. So they pull him back. Him and the friends would pull him back into the car. Uh, they get back on the road and they pull up to a diner uh, because. This diner exists in this abandoned town full of feral children. They gotta eat. I guess. Uh, so there's so many questions I already have at this point. They pull up to the diner. They went in and they ask if there's any uh, any kids in the town. We find out that there's only three people that live in the town. The couple that run the diner. And the site maintenance guy also known as the mayor. The self-appointed mayor, basically, because base he's just there to make sure that nobody really comes into the town and um, I guess steal stuff or gets hurt. Yeah, that's really what his whole point is. The mayor tells them to go look around, but stay on the asphalt. Don't go into any of the houses and stay away from the high school because it's bad up there. They get to this little restaurant. Diner, whatever you want to call it. As they go in, Beck and Jiminy talk to Agnes, who is the waitress. They want to ask her questions about the local legend. And she tells Beck that she had already talked to him on the phone. And she told him that it wasn't worth his time to come out there. That it was just a myth. Local legend. There wasn't anything to it. And he said that, you know, he figured that it was worth checking out because he wanted to get all the information basically straight from the horse's mouth in order to have it the experience in order to write his graphic novel and she still tells him basically the same thing you know i'm sorry you guys came all this way you basically wasted your time but they start to give him information you know well there's really just three of us here blah 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 because he asked if there were any children in the town because they wanted to try to find the parent of the child that they thought had dropped the brick on his windshield. During this whole conversation, Beck's girlfriend goes into the bathroom and takes a pregnancy test. But it's not a pleasant bathroom, mind you. It's not very clean. Well, it's just a little dingy dive. Yes, but three people live in the town. 
Well, Agnes says that her and her husband live in a little trailer out back. And Ezrin is basically the town appointed mayor. And he, you know, makes sure people don't wander around the town and get hurt and or steal things or anything like that. He just basically is the caretaker of the yeah, town. Well, okay, so except for that missed part. <clears throat> okay, so they didn't order anything except because it was one of those... They didn't trust the uh, cleanliness of said uh, mm -hmm. food, right. I guess. Uh, so they got Cokes and chips, which, again, I assume the chips were probably outdated. And they were probably safer actually having the quote-unquote, you know, hamburger or whatever. But that's just me. So they start exploring the town. Ezrin told him, told them... After Agnes said, well, I don't know anything more than that. You can talk to Ezrin. He would know more. He can give you any information there is to know about the sinkers, is what they call them. He tells him, Ezrin tells Beck, to go take a drive through town and see for yourself. Stay on the asphalt. Don't go into any houses. And stay away from the high school. Yeah. Agnes doesn't think it's a good idea. And thinks they should just leave the town altogether. Beck thanks them for their hospitality. He pays for their snacks and they leave. So Beck and Candace have a touching moment. You know, just, I love you, blah, blah, blah. I don't like the SA. Then kick out the, uh, the windshield. Yeah, they remove the windshield altogether. I mean, it, yeah. it's garbage. It was actually more of a hazard to have the windshield in than not. And this is like, like a 60s muscle car type thing. So... Yeah, it's like an 80s Trans Am or... I don't know. It was... No, it's 60s like or that. 70s. It looked one of the earlier body types. I didn't know. It's an older vehicle. Yeah. So they go for the drive, and uh, Jiminy decides to get out of the car and explore a house in a few seconds. He needs to use the bathroom. You know, there's trees, and there's an abandoned house. I'm pretty sure no feral children. So, yeah, they're, walk they're driving pretty slow, so he just slips out the windshield and goes into a house when they specifically said not to do that. Yeah. Uh, and then the others go in and try to get them back. But uh, Beck gets out and goes in to get Jiminy back while Candace stays in the car. After a while being on her own, Candace sees something and goes into the house. And she, I mean, she just generally got spooked because she was alone. Well, it's dark. Yeah. And in an abandoned place. After catching up with Jiminy and Beck, they hear the car drive off, and we find Candace has left the keys in the car. They fight. They all look at their phones. Go find out that they don't have any uh, bars, or very few bars. Beck, they decide for Jiminy to go back to the, to the diner to get help. Which is what, like three miles or something like they said? They said around seven or so miles. Yeah, which doesn't seem like that would be the case, but what do I know? Uh, so Candace and Beck are chilling in the abandoned house and debating if they need to go walk back to the diner also. Um, Beck tries to see if he can get a signal by going to the going on top of the roof. He connects to 911, but it's constantly breaking up and there's a lot of static. Uh, Candace explores the house by herself. She, de she sees the car parked out back. Meanwhile, Beck is communicating. to trying to get through to 911. I'm missing Candace something. goes outside and yells at Beck because he's on the roof trying to get his attention. Okay. He really is not paying attention to her. He does hear something, but he's try focusing on trying to understand who's on the phone because the call's cutting in and out. As Candace is outside yelling at Beck, someone comes up behind her and shocks her with a cattle prod and yeah. drags her off. So then, with all this commotion, Beck is going towards that side of the roof trying to figure out what's going on, and then he sees the car yeah. on from the roof. And then he hangs up on 911 and goes out to the yeah. car. He gets down and goes towards the car. And, and then sees this person. So he... Um, well, actually, as Beck is racing to the car, calling out, like, 
Candace's name, he sees a blood trail trailing into the house. Beck then sees the figure opening the trunk. He races to the car, gets zapped, and sprayed it down. Then we see Candace caged up in what looks like an old school dog pen. Yeah. In, She's in, in a in, dog crate. In uh, like an old school high school. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, like that dingy, grimy high school type. Candace gets out and freaks out and calls for Beck. Then we see Beck is wrapped up like a mummy in duct tape. Um, He's not going to have to shave in a long time. <laughs> uh, then we hear a voice over the PA. It introduces, him, it introduces itself as the principal. He gives them a word of the day, which is initiation. Then he gives the definition. Then he gives them an orientation. He goes on and gives his theory that if you starve someone long enough, they will do anything to save their own skin. We also see him holding a positive pregnancy test. And we don't actually see the face, we just see the back of the head and the pregnancy test. And then he goes on and they, he says that uh, they will kill anyone, even for a sandwich. Then he says it's a horrible position to be in, especially when a loved one life is at stake. Then Candace picks up the dog cage, throws it at the camera that she sees. Because it's like one of those old noticeable cameras. She disables it. All the principal has to say is that uh, she was naughty and in no time they will have Viking Pride because I guess that was the school's mascot. Then the tall figure shows up, unlocks the gate, and sprays her. We see Beck freeing himself from the duct tape as the figure takes Candace's cage. As Beck is screaming, a young a teen shows up and tells him to hush and to whisper because the zookeepers don't like them talking to one another. Then she informs Beck about the way out and that she won't leave her daddy. Uh, as she escapes, the figure chases her but doesn't catch her. Then the figure gives Beck a half glass of water in a dirty cup. And I'm pretty sure they're going to have to get... Uh, some worm pills after all of this is done and over with. Um, well, they, he does. The big authoritative figure person doesn't catch the girl because she goes into a locker and yeah, then there's yeah. a tunnel she, system. I mean, she has. She knows her way around mm -hmm. this entire place. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying. You know, it's just. She probably has made her own tunnels and stuff like that. Mm hmm. Uh, they've obviously been there a while. Then the figure drops a Snickers. Beck goes for it. The figure steps on the candy bar and laughs. And the voice introduces the figures as Runyon. Then the principal invites them to join a balanced breakfast. As Runyon hits a buzzer which opens a door, Candace cries out to Beck only to be met with smoke or fog or whatever it is we see runyon haphazardly placing a english muffin eggs bacon and a drink on a tray beck enters another room to see so it's all sort of like interconnected these rooms are all sort of interconnected and so he was like basically in a waiting pen and then they go into other waiting like other people's waiting pens and that's the battle royale arena um, so Beck enters the other man's room to see a skinny man from the opening scene praying. He tells Beck he doesn't want to know anything about him. Then the man informs Beck that they aren't, they want them to starve, kill, and starve again. Then the man starts getting hostile. He tells Beck to stand still. He will make this quick. I always obey when somebody is threatening my life to just stand still. He's just gonna make. He's just gonna be quick about it. Don't worry, I'll kill you fast. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, then the principal informs them when the bell rings, they fight to the death for food. Then Runyon throws a rope and a pipe into the room. 
Beck doesn't want to fight, but the principal says he will allow a sub, which happens to be Candace, and uh, Beck changes his mind. Yeah. And uh, then the bell rings, the fight begins, Beck pleads to stop, but no. They fight, Beck pleads with the guy to stay down, he doesn't, the guy charges, his fingers get cut off. Next he looks at his hand in shock, he tries to charge again, Beck gets kill number one, uh, places the pipe, or I don't know if it's a pipe or a lawnmower blade, I can't make out what exactly what it is. It's hard to tell what exactly it is. So, but it's all stuff that's found within this, like, high school or within the town. It's like, it, and it also changes. It's sort of weird, like, at one point it looks like a pipe, and then, like, but it ends up in this guy's neck, between, like, the neck and the shoulder. And then it's like, maybe it is a lawnmower blade? I think some of these objects are stuff that they manufacture with just things that are lying around. Yeah. I give it four out of five. It's just the first kill. Uh, the principal congratula- congrats, uh, congratulates Beck. In a flight of rage, Beck throws something. Sir Runt takes the food away. Beck is like, no, I'll eat it. He takes the tray and starts eating the bacon when Runt, Runt enters to take the rope away because he comes in so that he can't use the other weapon to kill Runt or Runyon or whatever it is um, and then Beck in another sort of fit of rage decides to throw the tray the principal tells him what a waste and that's uh, all he will be getting for the for a while but at least there is the severed hand and he's like well at least there's finger foods or whatever and and there's the severed hand. Um, Beck then takes the ring off the hand, which I don't understand that sort of scene. Like, uh, we see Candace spying on the, uh, the principal through a hole in the wall. And, uh, then she sees a cockroach and eats it. And then next we see Beck retrieving the duct tape and doing something. Candace sees the young girl and as she visits her, tells her eating that bug was nasty and offers her a large jar of water to drink. And she informs Candace that her and her daddy have a plan to save everyone. As Candace is warning her of the camera, Runtz grabs her and starts taking her away to another room. And then she gets locked in. Beck makes sure she is okay when the principal announces uh, it's time for a Donner party. The girl knows what that means. Next we see a bloody mess of a guy. As the principal explains, this is, his reigning champ has developed a taste for human flesh. And uh, the little girl will not, the girl will not survive. And, and no traditional food will be won if somehow she wins. So all bets are off the table, basically. Because she broke the rules. And this is against his plan, man. Uh, Nira, I guess the girl, notices a hook in the floor. Uh, a, a hole? hole? Yeah, a hole. <laughs> it would be nice if it was a hook. A hole in the floor before the man's released. Uh, we are subjected to another word of the day. It's a uh, gourmandize. Nora, I guess it's Nora. I guess I wrote it down like 20 different weird times. <coughs> Tries to open the hole wider by, you know, trying to dig at it and stuff before he, before Donner is released. But she was too slow and we get kill number two. Uh... And she becomes a feast of brains. He picks her up, chucks her against the wall, cracking her head wide open. And he chows down on those yummy, yummy brains. But he didn't have any faba beans. No. And as he is munching on his victory, 
Runyon releases the releases the seal to Beck's door. Beck wraps the duct tape around the handle and crawls on the floor in an effort to avoid Donner. Then we see Runyon enter the dark room with a woman laying on the floor humming. The principal informs them it is said it is said that women are more vicious than men and he can't wait for a good cat fight. Running carries her in. Well, puts her on like a like a pallet. Yeah. On wheels and carries and brings her and in. Brings her in. Just dumps her off on the floor. Uh the principal introduces uh Virgo or Virgo or whatever. Uh and Runyon drops her on the ground and shocks her and she gets up ready to go, calling Candace a whore and other explicitives. Um, Runyon throws in a pair of scissors. Uh, and we notice that Runyon is sort of taking a liking to Candace. And she sort of try, tries to toss the scissors as close to Candace as um, mutantly possible. Suggesting cut those titties off. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mutantly possible, so she chucks it in. Or, sorry, I, I completely ruined. Um, in the fight, Candace yells at uh, Virgo, frightening her. The fight seems more scissors going flying, and then and flying and biting happens. So, there's she bites the arm, and scissors are in the air, and People are running with scissors, and we all know how that's dangerous. Uh, meanwhile, Beck is trying to break down a door as uh, Donner claws to get at him. Candace gets kill number three. Okay, crazy lady. Uh, I give it a two out of five because we really don't see what happened. Like, we just know that she got the scissors, went up, and then there was blood dripping on the hair. And then Virago falls down, and yeah, she's dead. That's all it matters. Yeah. Uh, Beck breaks out. Runyon hand delivers Candace a slice of pizza. Beck runs into the room, getting a face full of smoke or fog or whatever. I don't know what to call it. And punishment: Candace is left sliceless, and she shows Beck to the people as they were having a touching moment the principal shoots through the wall three times and he misses each time as they lay on the ground beck apologizes and tells her they are getting out candace sees runyon candy starts pleading for her food because she won it fair and square but beck steps in asks to deliver it to her then tries to stab runyon he misses. He wrestles the pizza out of Runyon's hands, and he starts to. And they sort of have this like weird like eat off. Like he eats a piece, and she eats a piece, and Runyon eats a piece, and it's just this weird. I thought he ate it all, and then made no she like made him feel bad, and then finally told yeah, him yeah, she was it, pregnant. It, so then he regurgitates yeah, it, and yeah, then she eats it. Yeah, but Runyon also is eating some of it to show dominance in a way. Like, if you're going to eat... Like, he grabbed, like, a part of it mm -hmm. and ripped off and ate that. You know, so they couldn't take it away. That was the concept. Running and ate the rest of the pizza to show dominance. Mm -hmm. But then he ends up regurgitating it and giving it to her because then he felt like crap because she told him well, she, she was pregnant. Yeah, and she also did, like, guilt trip him, let's be honest here. And he... I mean, it was a really dick move. I, uh, He's I, like, I'm starving. Yeah, and yeah. I'm having your baby. And he's like, well, I'm starving too, and I'm not having a baby. <laughs> uh, uh, and Candace gets pissed. He says he did it because he was hungry, and she spills the beans that she is prego with egos. Uh, Candace pleads to Runyon to get her more food and tells her she will do anything. Never uh, say that. Ever. <laughs> then Runyon pulls out his. Let's call back to the principal. <laughs> uh, uh, 
uh, principal's office. Candace Beck, um, Candace and Beck have a soft moment, which he gives her pizza back. It was a bit soggy, but she <laughs> ate every bite of it anyway. Yeah, and that that out just of, like Domino's. Out of oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's not good. The sauce is acidic, but you ate it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> oh, it's starving. I'm Brigo. Um, <laughs> I'm a pizza sauce. Yeah, and she, they actually show her eat a little bit, and I that just yeah. that just sort of like I was like, oh no, it's no. moist. Yeah, I was like, no, <laughs> no. Uh, I wonder how much they had to pay her to eat that. And as uh, and then we see running and watches from the office and uh, tell the principal tapes up the holes. We find out Runny and likes Candace and she has taken a liking to another in the past and we can assume that didn't go well, very according well. to the what what was implied it, it ended very badly badly so yeah she it's not encouraged for Runyon to uh to like other people get any kind of attachments yeah he order uh and then he orders Runyon around to burn the bodies which Runyon does Candace eats her winnings as we described lovingly in the past Beck notices Virago's body and takes out the scissors out of her eyes and starts chipping away at the wall. And uh, I'll get into it. The principal tells Runyon they need f- uh, fresh blood because the ca- because the cages he built weren't meant to stay empty for long. So he, he finds he's like he starts he finds like a hollow part in the like this brick wall like they're in a gymnasium. Like a basketball, you know, a basketball court, and he finds like a basically a a weak spot in the wall. He starts like chipping away, but the thing is, is they, they share a wall with the principal's office, mm-hmm. and he doesn't hear this going on. He watches TV. I guess she looks in to see that he's watching TV, and that's when they do it. Or when he's not there. Yeah. Because he goes to the diner and does other yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. He does mayorly stuff. Yeah. Mayoral. They do it when he's watching his shows. His shows. Yeah, when he's having his private time. He likes, uh, as the world goes round, okay? He likes big butts. <laughs> <laughs> when anybody says that combination of things, that's what comes into my head. But, yes. You know. Uh, we see a truck driver by the high school, a truck drive by the high school, and a pair of legs enter the diner. We see it's the mayor, ordering his usual. As he is sitting there, a woman walks in looking for Candace and Beck. We find out it's, they have been missing for a month. The, uh, the co-owner of the diner Tells her what she knows, and the mayor tells her he caught them stealing from a house, and he's locked them away, and he whips them constantly because they've been naughty, naughty, naughty little boys. No, we don't get that. No, honesty is not his policy. No, no, no. I escorted him out of town. Yeah, and uh, tells her he caught them stealing from a house. He shot at them. Uh, and they hightail it out of town. And he goes on about his duties. And the lady is okay. Take me around. He denies her. But she pulls the uh, pulls out that she has a warrant. Um, Beck continues to make his, uh, his hole. Uh, then we hear Ryan come check on them. And... Uh, and stare at Candace, Candace lovingly. Uh, mayor Ezer, as we realize who the mayor is. Yeah, that's the kind of person you can get a restraining order on and it won't make a damn difference. It's just a piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, Ezer takes the woman to the house. 
that they alluded. Uh, she wants to see the high school. He says it's too dangerous, but she insists. Because he keeps saying, you can't go to the high school, it's too dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, then that's where I, I need to be, because that's where they would go. <laughs> Logic. Uh, Candace tries to communicate with Runyon with no uh, avail. Ezra and the woman uh, arrive at the high school. He sees. He tells her he is getting uh, the lights. She spots Beck's car before he she gets hammered. Ezra goes through her stuff and uh, he she literally gets hammered. Doesn't yeah, he yeah. Clock her upside the head with a ball pit hammer. Yeah, it is hammering time. So he really does like big butts. And he cannot lie. But that's not by the artist. That's by... Tripping slot, yeah. Yeah. Mm, I get it. But not MC Hammer. No. But Ezra is MC Ballpoint Hammer. (laughs) (laughs) Could you imagine him doing that dance? Oh my god. No. Can't touch this. Ding, ding, ding. Whack. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding. Whack. It would be hilarious. <laughs> Skinny white dude version. Yeah. Ezra goes through his stuff. He tells Runyon uh, things have become more complicated. Then we meet Norman, who is uh, pleading for food. We find out that the, the chick is a cop. Which, I mean, the warrant thing is a thing that sort of dead giveaway. Uh, detective. Detective, whatever. Cop chick meets Norman. We all know how that goes. Never trust a person named Norman. These was, are life rules. He was hangry. But these are life rules. You can't trust anybody named Norman. No one named Norman Bates. <laughs> Hungry Norman. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Normans are bad people, I guess. Uh, she asks, what did they do to him? All he says is, you should be more concerned about what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> uh, and that could go two, one of two ways, but yeah. Uh, the principal, uh, Ezer, shows up to... Uh, to Beck and Candace's cell to deliver water and hoping to catch them in the act of breaking out. Which we find out that he's like, he's ex- pretty much successfully, at, he's pretty successful at it. I mean, he's getting through the wall and he's gotten to like the outside wall mm-hmm. and removed a brick. You know what they say? Another brick in the wall. Yep. And you can't have your pudding if you don't eat your meat. Mm-hmm. All right, <clears throat> enough of Pink Floyd references. Uh, you can only have it on the dark side of the moon. All right. These are reasons why you're not a comedian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I won't give up my day do- job. Not anytime soon. Nope. <clears throat> then we go through uh, initiation with Norman, and. Uh, Norman gets a curling iron, and the uh, the cop chick gets a uh, poker. The bell rings. The fight ensues with Sari, and she uh, she protests, and but Norman is hungry, and we get kill number four. Don't place curling irons into orifices. That is actually on the box for a reason. Mm-hmm. I give this a four out of five. So, he shoves that curling iron down her throat. He was hangry. He was hangry. He needed a schnickers. He needed to eat. Uh, Norman feasts on fries and a cheeseburger. This was about like half of a cheeseburger. So. Um, we see Beck has broken through the wall and pushes a brick out. As he, uh, as the hole he hears Candace hit the ground. And Beck checks on her only to see... Ezra drugged the water. He tainted the water supply. With some LSD. And some PCP. He's not a good man. Really, what gave that away? He's not a pal and principal. 
what gave that away? I told you in the beginning he wasn't. I know. I actually had a principal that says, I'm your principal. Yeah, that's a corny dad joke. Yep. Uh, Beck wakes up in a different cell to see Jiminy sitting in the corner. Ezra is on the, P- the PA saying he can't wait for this battle and ask who names their kid after a cricket. Bug lovers. Yep. Jiminy uh, is full of remorse about killing another person. We get another word of the day. Fratricide. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also find out that Ezra has been lamenting about the loss of someone he thinks he killed. So they make this big spiel. It's like, we get it. You probably did something bad. It's not your fault. We'll help you through it. We'll hug you. We'll give you cuddles at night. We'll just get through this together. Right. Yeah. Ezra is like, yeah, uh, I'm okay. I don't need your hugs. Kill one another. Um, then Rayon get uh, Rayon, <laughs> the fabric. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, actually, has like ray gun. Uh, gives them a gun with one bullet. He points to uh, Rayon. <laughs> Runyon. Runyon, yeah. Uh, he points to Runyon. Is the son that killed his mom. He points to Runyon as the son. So the, the think that Runyon and all this like circle of stuff that it could have happened was Runyon was actually the son and they both killed the mother. Yeah. That was a speculation. Uh, Beck tells Jiminy he isn't going to kill him and then we get and do some brotherly loving moments, Jiminy pulls the trigger on himself. So, he commits righteous suicide. Uh, Ezra decides to take the food away because he didn't kill his brother. Then the door unlocks and Beck exits to a larger arena. He sees pools of blood and Donner is ready to go. Runyon locks the cage. Donner comes at Beck. He lets all the rage out and bashes his skull in. It's pretty bloody. Um, I actually give that pretty much a 5 out of 5. It was just like honestly a good ending I guess. Uh, and then after he bashes the skull in of Donner uh he starts to taunt Runyon to fight him. Ezra go- goes to Candace's cage and points a camera at her. Then he throws Candace's unconscious body over her desk. Ezra tells her that raping isn't something he's going to do, but he's going to make an exception to prove how pissed he is. <laughs> uh, Candace wakes up and hits him with the desk. And kills him. So in like one fluid mode. So she grabbed like the legs of the desk. And threw herself up in the desk with her. And sort of like hit him in the back of the head with the desk. It was like that solid like desk piece. Yeah. The middle desk. Yeah. Uh, Beck grabs uh, Runyon. Through the cage as Candace escapes and yells his name. We find out Runyon is not a he, but a she, and has been horribly disfigured. Ezra appears as Candace enters the arena and gets clotheslined by Runyon. Candace and Beck are reunited in the cage, and Runyon sprays them topless, and we get a titty rating. Very disturbing burned body. Yeah. Let's just say that they were big, but mutiny. They are mutated. Disfigured. Yes. Sort of like where the flesh was peeling off. She's, she's a severe burn victim. Yeah. Beck threatens to kill 
Ezer, as he gives Runyon her coat, uh, Candace asks to why is she, uh, who is she, and we get what happened. That he and his family lived in the thriving freedom, town of Freedom. But it was decided, but it was declared a disaster area because of the, the methane. Mm-hmm. The methane cellars. Yep. Um, and the government seized it. Evic- uh, evict- evicted everybody and, uh, and like took it. As they were leaving, their car got swallowed up in the sink in a sinkhole. They were trapped. Yep. No one knows that they were down there. Uh, no one looked. There was no food. Just a jug of water because the engine kept overheating. We find out that he killed his son and ate him, pushing him to the breaking like the brink of the san- insanity or breaking point. Then we're, they were finally found. And instead of, you know, being rescued, they decided to eat the rescuers. Because that's what you do. Uh, they, and then they couldn't go back to polite society. Because they had the hunger for human flesh. No one would understand why they had to eat their own child in order to survive. Yeah. And then, you know, his wife was Severe, horribly disfigured. Yeah. Due to, you know, them getting burned. Yeah, we also find out that methane leaked into the hole, disfiguring Ran, Rayon, Runyon. Runyon. Then he blames society that he uh, declares left them to waste away in the town that wasted away. Now Freedom and his... And... Uh, Freedom is, is his, and when people come nosing around, he likes to introduce them to a game uh, he likes to play. He also likes to eat some hand sandwiches. Mm. Mm. Bony. Bony. I'm bony, I'm bony. Leave me alone. Vic tells uh, Runyon it's not her fault. Ezra tells Runyon to give Beck a gun with one bullet, which Candace picks up. He tells Beck to starve to death or kill Candace and have a good dinner. Then Runyon throws the bullet into the cage. Beck rushes for the gun, but Candace won't uh, give it to him. Added to an, uh, another issue, flooded the arena with methane. Candace shoots Beck. Runyon is told to fetch the girl and because they have unfinished business. Then Beck gets up, thinks Runyon, uh, takes Runyon's uh, shock stick and uses it on her. And we get kill number five. It's a two out of five. It's just eh. Uh, Candace gets the key uh, and gets out. Beck gets the other bullet and uh, they split up. Ezra sees them on his camera as he is loading a tape into a vanilla envelope. As her voice plays on the intercom, Beck goes into the office to find out uh, Ezra isn't there, it's just a recording. Uh, he smashes the TV, breaks through the wall, and goes to the escape hole. Uh, meanwhile, Candace tries to find, she finds her way into like where the cars are kept. He keeps all the cars. Uh, and we see that he's been doing this for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of cars in there. Uh, finds a car to get out. She gets um, outside to see a cop car with lights on it. And out of excitement, she waves it over and go find out it's Ezra playing cop. Uh, she gets to roll over it. Yeah, she gets, she gets, and she gets to roll over the car. So she gets hit, rolls over the car. Then Ezra gets out, flips her her over, cocks his gun, gives a word of the day, and Beck shoots him. And we get kill number six, three out of five, multiple shots. He deserved it. They reunite. She wonders what superhero plays dead. And we go find out is one of his original comics trigger happy. Uh, 
a character he invented. Beck goes to Ezra's corpse to get his keys because he wants his car back. They drive off as they are going down the road. Beck tells Candace to open the glove box and she finds an engagement ring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then they see cops, ambulances, and fire trucks going to freedom. We uh, see that the uh, we see what they found the cop chick's body and a survivor. We also see that Norman is also like hiding, and he found his escape, and uh, we get the end. If some dude had talked me into going to some little shanty town like that and I almost damn died because of some funky road trip he wanted me to go on to write a novel. Not any novel. A graphic novel. A graphic novel. Okay. And then he had the nerve to ask me to marry him after I almost died. I'd be freaking choking his choking him by shoving that ring down his throat. Mm -mm. That's a pretty strong opinion. <laughs> yeah, that there'd be some choking going on, and not in a nice way. So, what's your score? I would give it a 3 out of 5. Uh, there were parts where it seemed like it kind of drug on a little bit. Yeah. And... Um, there were just some things that were difficult to decipher in parts. Um, like you said, the town, they seemed like they drove for maybe five minutes, but it was supposed to be miles that they had driven. Like, you never get, like, the full layout of this, like, this town, how big it was, or even, like, what the population was. Some of the details are just a bit sketchy. Um, yeah, it's... Just some finite details could have been a bit more clear to just sharpen the details of what was going on. And then just randomly the cop showed up at the end. Like, I get the, 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 no, well, that the detective not returning or, you know, things like that would have probably triggered cops to come. But it wasn't just cops. It was like EMTs and everything like that. So... Yeah, unless I think of, like, they finally released nine. But this was a month? Like, you don't understand the time lapse unless they said that it was a month, too. Right. Like, you didn't real Like, it just didn't seem... Like, time just seemed like it could have been a week. Or, yeah. like, two. And how long had it been since the detective had been there? Yeah. And the cops wouldn't have just sent EMTs there. There would have been detectives to come out. And then they would have contacted EMTs to come out and yeah. fire department or whatever. So, I, yeah. if it's a dead town and there's a fire that sets off smoke alarms and stuff, you would think if it's a dead town that those systems would already be deactivated. Wait, okay, so we do actually have dead towns in in the country. There's some in Ohio. There's one in Ohio that I know of. And there is Centralia. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania and for the most part you're not able to drive to down the actual road yeah. to these towns because the government when the government seizes the land they don't want people on said property so they will blockade basically get rid of any signage of the town ever existing so they will leave the buildings up because they can't tear them down for the most part. Yeah, the cost of term down is yeah. more than what's necessary. And usually the, the city will, like, bucket Kansas and stuff like that. They will pay the people to leave. They just don't come in. And there's a process for the evacuation. Right. So, like, sort of the whole premise sort of got to me. Knowing, like, how usually the evacuations happen. It's usually organized. You know, they make sure... I, I assume. I mean, it is the government, so. Uh, but I assume that, you know, the names will be checked off. Right, there's a checklist they have to go through, procedures. Yeah, and so there there would be some sort of procedure. So somebody might know that they were missing. Uh, like, but this had, these people had been living here for what seemed like years 
because he'd been collecting all these cars. Yeah. But, I mean, he was in a position where he could stay in the town. To ward off people from coming in and making sure that, you know, whatever, that, you know, so for public safety. But then again, I don't understand the diner. If it's a dead town, why have a diner in the middle of a dead town? Yeah, there's a lot of kind of, <laughs> huh, kind of things that are in this movie. Yeah, and why Florida of all places? If they filmed in, it would have been fine if they just did it in Mississippi. There's plenty of like, Weird, vast lands of Missis- in Mississippi that, that this could easily take place in. So, my rating was like a 3.5 out of 5. It was overall an interesting film. Like, the premise of, like, starving and stuff like that. Yeah, that, the general concept is pretty good, but the finite details yeah. were questionable the, the, at best. The premise of the film is okay. The reasoning why he does it was very weak to me. Like, I did it to, like... Give a middle finger to the rest of society because I did this thing. And you all deserve to pay for what I did. I sort of like that it did bring in, like, you know, the cannibals and stuff like that. You know, like, people do would go mad in that type of situation. Now, there was one part of it that I would like to have seen it sort of explored. And this, this would have been sort of, like, an interesting weird subplot or interesting sort of like wow this is sort of screwed up that he was actually making more money by selling these videos because he put it the like the video in that envelope let's say there's like a mar- there's probably a market out there for that type of thing so why put that in the envelope i mean it can't just be like he's just trying to get away and he doesn't want proof I assume there's just like stacks of videos that he gets off on. But I like the idea that he is like shipping them off to somebody. <laughs> or he was shipping them off to like random people. You know who joined. He had an audience that wanted to see this. That's why he staged certain people against other people to get yeah. that type of thing. And then that's why he made, and I like to, maybe that had been more of like a better sort of, me asserted that way, but then he wanted money, then he liked the money that was coming in, and he liked the power, and just the trip. Yeah, that would have made more sense for his motivation than say, oh, well, society put me in this situation, and I had to eat my son, so therefore I'm doing this to get one back at society. Yeah. And I mean, that, that makes less sense. And then, it's just, so there was that, and then, you know, just generally, like, why he was freaking out about the cages type thing. Like, my cages can't stay empty because I have to make money, or yeah. we have an audience, or, I mean, he set up, like, a whole huge arena in this high school. Not just the single ones, but inside, you know, the, the main gym, he set up a... Mm-hmm. Huge arena that people watch. It was watch. like a cage match. <laughs> yeah, that other people would watch. So, and then you don't get like, who are those other people that are outside the cages watching said cage match? Like, are they part other people that have been in those fights too? It, there's just a lot of like. But if you were traumatized from that, you're not going to want to come back there and watch. Yeah. So. Like, you give a certain amount of money, you could come and see the, the... You could be a part, you know, a, you could watch these these cage matches, you know, in real life. And I like the motivation of money, and that's what he was doing, instead of just because society abandoned me, so therefore, screw you, well, I'm going to make... It has more logic. It's more ingrained in logic than the other explanation. Yeah. Uh, and then how did you feel about the uh, Runyon uh, sort of character? I mean, I like that they kept it more kind of neutral and then explained it later the way they did. I mean, it that makes more sense to me than just explaining it outright. Now, if they had done that with him, instead of saying his motivation was what it was, then... 
the film would have been on another level. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about Runyon. It was just a big old titty reveal was just sort of like, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this. It was one of those weird moments. One of those weird moments. I mean, he's very monogamic. Just... But they seem like, even if it was, I mean, it was his wife and stuff like that, they didn't even seem to even, he didn't even, he treated it, treated Runyon. So, and there's, so I'm, and then there's that whole confusion. He on, treated her like. A slave. A slave. But the thing is, is like, so Runyon got severely burnt. I'm pretty sure Runyon was not the original name of the, of his wife. That's their last name. Okay. Uh, so. But they didn't. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure. But I've never ex really explored methane poisoning in massive quantities. But I don't think it would make you a mindless per like a mindless person. But then there's sparks that it isn't running isn't mindless. But he treats her like she is. Mm -hmm. But who's to say he didn't do something? And bash her upside the head with a damn hammer. Or. She just lobotomized looks at her. or he just looks at her like an object, like she's a piece of furniture. But I mean, I sort of would like to have seen, like at the end too, that Runyon finally turns on him. That would have been nice. Just some. I feel like it will led up to that. She like, like Candace. We know something bad happened with the last person she liked. And we're assuming that he killed her or something. It yeah, you assume that he did something to that person, whether she knew exactly what the true, the truth upon that, is probably you know it's not told, but I would say he probably didn't tell her the truth as to what had happened because that would allow him to continue to manipulate her. But my point is, it would be nice to see Runyon turn on him because she just either had enough of his crap, you know, or. Whatever. Or she just went off the rails because of all the violence. Mm. And she wanted somebody to survive that she liked. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to know what the motivation is when things aren't explained. So. Well, and again, I think that they sort of killed the concept of motivation in this. They were going out for, see, people do anything if they starve. That was the basis of it. And then that's what the movie's called. No, no, I I, I get that, <laughs> but I mean, this is like it would have been a little bit better if they just did some little tweaks here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, just selling off the, the like we just see that there's an address on the on the envelope would have been just like ah, uh, so there is a money factor in it. Yeah. I think that would have been cool. That's just me, though. It would have made a difference. Yeah. Um, I did like the setup, though. Like, the setting of it. I just didn't understand the ending, either. I think the ending bothered me with all, like you said, all the EMS. You know, like, the fire department, the, the cops, and... Yeah, it's... The details of it were uh, off. And then, you know, for her to, let's say... This detective, even to go up by themselves, was a little weird also. You think that they would have at least somebody else to come along. Yeah, because they make it seem like it's a distance. Quite a distance away. Yeah. Like, it was a road trip. It yeah. wasn't just, like, 20 minutes down the road. Yeah. But even then, you were thinking something like, somebody's missing, something bad could happen, whatever. You would want to at least have another another person there to assist and said issue yeah. you know usually you know i'm just saying usually in, in bad you know we you know when you see something bad is going on you see multiple cops <laughs> you know go to a scene so you think something like that would have happened in this situation but again it's just like because I didn't even realize she was a detective or a cop. I thought she was, like, the agent of the guy. Mm. You know, and I, that's where originally where I thought that she was, was the agent. Because I assumed that 
he has this graphic novel he has a timeline she wanted he said he's going to go research at this town and she's like well he hasn't been i haven't heard anything back we're getting close to that timeline and almost feel like that's what she was and then it was revealed that she was a detective yeah that's the one disappointing thing it just it could have been explained a bit better slightly better slightly just slightly a little bit better but overall i mean it was an okay movie it's well that's starve definitely not, definitely not appropriate for children but as we always say view it for yourself and make that choice well this movie has definitely made me hungry for human flesh so with that said bye <laughs> Scare you later. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>